all for coming. This is the first in a series of hearings. Uh, we have a couple of more at, uh, I know one's at downtown City Hall, one's at uh, Van Nuys City Hall. They'll be at 6 p.m. Uh, we'll also be having our normal uh, daytime hearings, but I want to try to uh, accommodate as many people as possible. So, um, you know, today is, is, is another step in our conversation where it relates to uh, uh, medical uh, marijuana and, and the possibility of recreational uh, cannabis. Now, it's going to take me a while to get into cannabis, okay, because I come from when it was reefer, okay, <laughs> and so cannabis is a little, we didn't use that in the neighborhood where, where I grew up. But the reality of the situation is uh, we, we need to have a real conversation about regulations, uh, taxes, what the community really feels. And it's important to me that we have the people from the industry hear what the people in the community feel. I want you to get a, uh, and, and I don't know if we'll be that successful uh, tonight, but at one of the, our f uh, uh, hearings that are coming up, we're going to have a panel of just community people that will talk about the various concerns that they have, and they're legitimate concerns. And I go to meetings on a regular basis, and I hear these concerns. So what what I had hoped is this would be an opportunity to begin a back and forth uh, conversation. Uh, it's not going to, in my opinion, go away, and we'll see what happens in less than a week because that, again, might expand our conversation. So on November 29th at City Hall at 6 p.m., we'll have our next hearing. Uh, on Wednesday, December 7th at 6 p.m. at Van Nuys City Hall, we'll have our next, next hearing. And Andrew, I don't know where you are, but I'm sure we'll have that on a website somewhere that will give the exact addresses and all of that. And, and the more the merrier, I want people to really turn out and to participate. Uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for neighborhood councils. I really listened to them. They have provided me with uh, wonderful guidance, so I want to make sure that they are part of this conversation. But with that said, I think we start this off. I'm going to ask the city people to come up and kind of walk us through. Everybody should have received uh, this document. We don't have a screen, so we won't screen, so we won't be able to do the PowerPoint but we'll walk through it together. And then we have, a, 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 I think, a very interesting panel that are here today. Anybody that wants to speak before this committee, please fill out a card. I'll be calling people up off and on and in between and what have you, and we hope to move this along. Uh, Mr. Harris Dawson, did you want to say something? Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to everybody that's uh, here tonight. I'm very excited about uh, the process that we're about to undertake or that we're undertaking by be beginning here. Uh, and hearing from the community from one end of the city uh, to the other, uh, those of you who know me know that uh, I spent a lot of uh, my time at Community Coalition where uh, we worked a lot on the the legacy of the over concentration of liquor stores in south l.a was one of our main issues we also worked on dealing with the symptoms and the problems created by the wrong-headed and uh expensive and often outright racist war on drugs and as the war on drugs comes to a close uh in this country and we chart a new path uh, the legalization and 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 regulation of of mer medical mer of recreational marijuana is probably one of the most important things that we'll do and we'll set the, the groundwork uh, for uh, the country and, and our community going forward. And so we have many lessons uh, to uh, learn from the past and hopefully we can use this opportunity to correct uh, a lot of the mistakes we made as a society in the past. 
Well, thank you for that. So let's get started. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call up. Hey, where are the public comment? Oh, right here. Is that the mic for public comment to my left? Okay. So uh, I'm going to do four public comment cards. Uh, I'm going to call Tamar up first. It's getting to a point where I know people by first name, Sarah Armstrong. Okay. Ruth uh, Scribner. And is this Sean Lang? That's a new name for me. Please come up. Well, Tomar, I know what you look like. Where are you? There you are. Come on. And if I called you, just line up behind him. Well, who's ready? Are you ready, Sarah? You are always ready. So we'll start with you. Mr. President and honorable members of the council, I am Sarah Armstrong, Director of Industry Affairs for Americans for Safe Access, the nation's oldest advocacy organization for patients. I also stand in strong support and um, we are in a partnership with the Southern California Coalition. One of the reasons we are so proud to be associated is that they are the only group of activists and stakeholders who have specifically staked out the territory of trying to correct historical inequities for minorities and women. They are the first collection of stakeholders and activists to come forward and stress this as one of their key platforms. For my own feelings, I feel very strongly that we will never end the rogue incursions into our neighborhoods until we have a licensing system so that we always know who is the legal correct operator and who is just trying to rip people off. I am so very pleased that you've taken this on. I have heard many ugly stories about things going on in neighborhoods and I hope that before I end my public career that I will see an end. Thank you, thank you. Okay, please. Hi, my name is Ruth Scribner, and I'm a resident of Wilshire Vista uh, neighborhood. Uh, I live close to the corner of Spalding and Pico. Mm -hmm. And if you walk down uh, my street, Spalding, and hit Pico, there's a dispensary on the left, and right across the street, there's another one, and then there's another one to the right. So the, I can see three. I'm standing on the corner of Spalding and Pico. Uh, it's just too many. So I'd like to see when the city is going to adopt ordinances uh, it, to enact a comprehensive regular, regulatory framework that they really look at responsible development. And I know that you mentioned schools, you know, not being within the area where children are, but also, you know, there's neighborhoods, children live in this neighborhood. Uh, we, baby carriages, people walk, we all we use our street. And I believe in San Diego there's a regulation that states they have to be a thousand uh, feet apart from one another. Um, so anyway, just throwing that out there. Thank you. No, I, I really appreciate, whoa, I wish my voice was this powerful all the time. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming out because it's important that everybody hears your concerns, and if there was a semi-flaw in the last time that we tried to put something together as a council, I don't think we incorporated enough suggestions and recommendations from our residents. So I do appreciate you coming, coming, and I hope as this process continues, we'll get more and more folk from the community. So thank you, okay? Thank you. And we will listen. Okay, Tomar, are you ready? Uh, yes, I am. Um, <clears throat> well, I uh, would like to say that first, a limit on a number of licenses is a limit on innovation, creativity, and competition. I think it will prevent entrepreneurs from pursuing new ideas and adding value to the market. I think that many unlicensed bin business owners are very good at running an <clears throat> unlicensed and somewhat unregulated and in some cases illegal businesses avoiding taxes, detection, and following common regulations. I think the city should allow them this chance to run a legal business, all of them, um, and because these additional requirements and standards would make it maybe not so valuable and uh, not so 
uh, incentivize for them to do it. I think a healthy competition of licensed businesses will create a level playing field where and we would force those businesses that offer to offer bus better services and to offer more value to patients in order to be successful and profitable in the market. Um, and I believe the best way to reduce the black market is by encouraging to, it to step into the light and, and become legalized. Otherwise, they'll just keep doing what they've been doing. Thank you. Thank so you. do I have uh, Sean Lang? Sean, yes, okay, man. Yes, you do. Um, however, and then we'll have, I'm gonna do one more, George Richmond. George Richmond. Yes, sir. Yes, counsel, I misunderstood what the speaking uh, card was for. I, I actually did not want to comment at this time. Okay, then Sorry that's that. that's okay. Do we have Richmond? Yes. Come on down. This is not the price is right, but come on down. <laughs> Hi, my name is George Richmond. Um, I was a 2013 Planning and Land Use Chairman for uh, Mink back oh, in 2013. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. How are you all? Um, I think that it's about time that uh, we loosen our restrictions on certain uh, elements of cannabis and, and marijuana now that, that it's going to become uh, legal for recreational use. But I agree that restricting the density uh, or the amount of um, licenses is, is counter to uh, growing the industry, which is what we want to do. Um, restricting the density of marijuana outlets Sure, um, it, like, like liquor stores are, are restricted. I think there should be some similar, very similar, not anything more. Um, for the personal cultivation, um, cultivation um, as far as nuisance complaints for the smell of it, um, I do not think that that should be valid because you have feral cat colonies and like 10 cats living next door to some houses where they smell like cat piss, sorry, and there's nothing done about that. So. With that, you can say that marijuana is much, smells much better, and there shouldn't be any restrictions or nuisance for that. And I'm being dead serious, people. You don't know what it's like to walk past a house oh, that smells okay. like that. Okay, and, and okay no, no your time, but I, I'm gonna ask you a question real quick. Sure. The smell, are you talking about folks that are taking, smoking the, 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 the medicine on site or are you just talking about the scent of the the scent of the plants for okay. cultivation gotcha all right Other than cat piss okay all right i know a bunch of old ladies that might debate that with you but <laughs> anyway why don't we turn now to Mateus and your team and if you would uh, uh walk us through the uh uh the options okay uh good evening committee members panelists ladies and gentlemen uh, my name is Matias Farfan. I'm from the Chief Legislative Analyst Office. I'm joined uh, by Yolanda Chavez and Jason Killeen from the CAO's office. And just to get us started, back in August, uh, we released a report uh, to this committee uh, in regards to the, the city's uh, medical marijuana law, which is Proposition D, and also the, uh, the ballot measure, the Adult Use Marijuana Act, that people will be voting on next week. And we presented there, and um, we were subsequently given instructions to report back on a series of items. Uh, the presentation that was handed out when you walked in, it's a series of nine slides that, that summarizes that report at a high level, and we'll just go through that quickly right now. Uh, the, the first page, titled Executive Summary, uh, simply brings us to where we're at today, uh, which is that uh, the state recently passed the Medical Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act, it was previously referred to as MRSA, but the name has been changed. And uh, this law requires medical marijuana businesses to obtain a state license and a local license permit in order to operate lawfully within California. Uh, the city currently does not issue a license permit or other authorization under Proposition D. So uh, right off the bat, there, there are issues that, that with current medical marijuana dispensaries within the city of LA, once this law goes into effect, they will not be able to operate legally under the state law until uh, they receive a permit from the city of LA. If uh, Prop D compliant businesses are to conform to the state law, as I mentioned, the city would need to update its regulatory framework. Uh, the city could adopt ordinances to uh, enact a comprehensive regulatory framework, which could cover the entire supply chain for the marijuana related businesses. And uh, these are these meetings uh, that our chair has uh, arranged to get public feedback on those. 
uh, imposition of new taxes or an increased existing taxes would require a ballot measure. Going to the next page, it, it provides uh, some background of how we got here. It, it all started back uh, in, on November 5th, 1996, California enacted Prop 215 and became the first state to establish a medical, medical marijuana program. In May 2013, the city enacted Prop D to provide an enforcement and regulatory framework for medical marijuana dispensaries in the absence of state regulation. In 2015, the state enacted MCRSA, and again, M MCRSA recognizes a large range of medical marijuana businesses such as cultivation, uh, product manufacturing, distribution and transportation, testing laboratories, and dispensaries. Going on to the next slide, um, Medical Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. Uh, the Bureau of Medical Cannabis Regulation within the Department of Consumer Affairs was created to administer and enforce MCRSA. MCRSA divides state licensing and enforcement responsibilities among three agencies. The Department of Food and Agriculture, which will issue medical marijuana cultivation licenses. No, no. Oh, the Department of Consumer Affairs will issue licenses for medical marijuana dispensaries, distributors, and tra transporters and the Department of Public Health will issue licenses for medical marijuana manufacturers and testing laboratories. Regarding regulatory options available to the city is uh, to the regulatory framework category since MC, MCRSA establishes a state framework for regulating all aspects of the medical marijuana industry the city has the option of allowing some or all such businesses through some form of local regulatory permit license system to allow them to continue to operate. Uh, permissive zoning, uh, that's the zoning code is drafted in a permissive fashion such that any use not enumerated therein is presumptly, presum presumptively prohibited. And last is express bans, which uh, MCR SA recognizes a range of new medical marijuana businesses, including cultivators, manufacturers, distributors, transporters, and testing laboratories. The city may opt to ban all, all or specific activities under MCRSA. So even though MCRSA allows these, uh, uh, these types of businesses to operate, it, it, they do require that the city permit them to also operate. So there's a dual permitting that, that's required under this law. Uh, moving on to Adult Use of Marijuana Act, which uh, it, it's AUMA is a statewide initiative that California voters will consider uh, next week. Uh, AUMA's passage would legalize recreational marijuana throughout the state and allow the city at its sole discretion to institute a licensing system for cultivation, manufacturing, processing, distribution, and testing of marijuana, mirroring that in MCRSA. Uh, but the difference is, is that AUMA does not contain a dual licensing requirement. So marijuana related businesses can apply for a state license without having to show proof of compliance with local regulations. So they can independently apply for a state license without having already received a city license. Unlike MCRSA, which requires them to obtain a city license prior to applying for the state license. Uh, that said, I'll, tr I'll transfer over to Yolanda. Hello, good evening. I'm Yolanda Chavez with the City Administrative Officer's Office. Um, I'm going to go through some of the fundamental questions that um, the Council will have to answer as we develop our regulatory framework. So let me start with the first one, which is should the City allow MMDs or medical um, marijuana dispensaries granted, um, should we allow them to get granted limited immunity from enforcement under Prop D to continue to operate when M MCRSA goes into effect? Should the city allow them also granted immunity from enforcement under Prop D to engage in the expanded marijuana activities provided in state law? And um, should the city establish precedence for these 135 medical uh, marijuana dispensaries for expanded activities? If AUMA or AMA passes, should the city consider establishing regulations 
authorize, authorizing some or all recreational marijuana businesses. Other considerations um, that have to be answered is whether to create a criminal and criminal and administrative penalties and give the regulatory authority the ability to suspend and or revoke a business license or any other permit or authorization. Um, next, should we require annual renewals of licenses and permits and possibly require all employees to have a permit to work in a, in a marijuana business, similar to the city's regulation for employees involved in ammunition sales? Registration and permitting process, it, should that be clear, should, should that clearly state which businesses are authorized? And of course, a really key one is, should licenses be tied to the physical locations and not to, in, and not to individuals? Next, in terms of ensuring that we um, are able to collect the revenue and the fees, should all MRBs or medical and recreational businesses in the city be taxed at the same rate? What type of inspections and or permit fees should be charged to MRBs? And what type of penalties should be imposed or charged on MRBs? Uh, finally, the last page of the PowerPoint lists all of the reports that we have issued, the CAO and the CLA jointly. Um, so, so I don't want to go through the list, but if there are any questions on these reports, we'll be happy to answer those. Okay, thank you. Uh, in fact, I want to thank you guys very much, and I, I meant to say this at the beginning of the hearing uh, for the folks that are here with us today. Uh, the city staff is not required to work overtime. I mean, for Marquise and myself, there's really no such thing as being off, you know, but for the other folk, uh, this is you know, they're going above and beyond. So I just want to officially say that I appreciate you working with me. I appreciate that in the past we've had a series of hearings uh, that I felt were important that we had in the evening so individuals could come after work and you have always, always been there. And I just want to say on the record that I appreciate it and, and that you guys are the best and I wouldn't trade you in for anybody. And I'm sure the people that are here appreciate you. You could be watching the World Series right now. And I am from Cleveland. So I'm gonna do a couple of more cards, or, you know, we'll see. Eric uh, Holstrom, is that Lenny or Jenny? Lenny? Ryan Greenlaw? Lawrence, you, some of you guys are gonna have to help me with the last name. So when I call you, just come on up, and if you get there first, just identify yourself and speak. Go ahead. I'm Eric Hallstrom. I'm with the Southern California Coalition. I also I remember you. I'm president of an organization called the Cultivators Alliance. We represent 200, over 250 small family businesses in the cultivation space for medical cannabis. The reason that this cultivation space exists is because retail shops are in a quasi gray area space right now for the most part and uh, we're fulfilling the need that is required uh, and these are small local businesses. I would like to say as far as, uh, as far as my part of the industry and a lot of others I know that it is important to us to work with the neighborhoods and the community because we are all Angelinos and we all want a safe city for everybody to work in. Hopefully, you know, I mean our industry also has good paying jobs as well, and that's another thing we want to provide to our, our neighbors and family in the city. And so as far as odors, I do think it's important for the odors to be controlled. I don't think anybody should have to smell marijuana walking down the street, and that's something that our industry can do through best practices to make sure it doesn't happen. Also, to delineate the permitted shops from the unpermitted shops, it's important to make sure that there's a delineation because the rogue shops are, are not accountable. The quasi-permitted shops we have here they, they can lose something, Thank so it's like different actors. So, Thank, Thank you. you. And what's good pay? Uh, on average, in the cultivation, on average, based on a survey of 38 of our members, the average wage is $20.50 an hour for an employee in a cultivation site. That's the average. And that's cultivation. Right. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Identify yourself. 
Hi, I'm Lenny Gator. Uh, hey. I run, I run HailMaryJane.com. It's a cannabis culture blog and podcast. I moved out here. Um, first of all, I want to appreciate, thank you guys for, you know, uh, going above and beyond. I moved out here from the East Coast to kind of document this time in history and, see, and be a part of I, the change. Um, I started this because I appreciate the culture, but I started to learn about like the real medical benefits around it, like all of the, the disparities in the arrests and like the real corruption behind why it's illegal. And so like it really became more of a mission for me. So, you know, one of the things I really want to highlight that I don't hear a lot of people talk about, I've been to all of these city council meetings and I, I haven't had the courage to come up and speak, but you know, in Colorado, they, they use a lot of these taxes towards schools. So like they use a lot of that revenue, like millions of dollars in revenue every year towards schools. So they're literally taking this from being a, a criminal issue to being and taking that money out of the 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 black market and putting it into education you know and that that's something that i think can change our society fundamentally so. thank you so if i could get the next speaker next couple of speakers my name yes. is my name is lawrence clutie i'm from the mid city neighborhood council and hey man all right <laughs> my my view is or question or comment i might say is that as I, as I go through all these regulations and report, I don't see that much of intensity on anything dealing with public health. Uh, I, I'm a preacher, one, and I'm also a public health in inspector by profession. And uh, I look at both ways. I see that, yes, it's going to bring revenue Yes, it's going to bring jobs. Yes, there will be billions of dollars generated. Taxes, good. But my question is, will that one soul watching 60 Minutes, I don't know, I don't know how many of you watched 60 Minutes this Sunday, where they were talking about Colorado on this situation issue. And they're saying that babies now, as a baby is born and tested, the mother taking marijuana, the baby has about seven times that okay. amount of marijuana in them. So now, you got to wrap it up. So now, uh, the regulations and the rules that are going to be, ordinances that are going to be put in place, we know that it's here already. Okay. Well, look, uh, Mr. Harris Dawson has a question for you. I, I can only go about a minute a person. I give everybody a little bit over. So I'm going to cut you off, but he has a question for you. And really, really quickly, because I saw the 60-minute segment, too. I thought it was really educational about Colorado's experience. What in, like, a sentence or two might a public health um, framework or a public health infrastructure for legalization look like? Uh, from your point of view as a public health professional? Okay, look, look, looking at it, it's like, now, looking down the road, they said that there is, according to, to, the, to the report, there is, like, a study of tw 25 years has shown that these people that have this in their system, it does not only be in the bloodstream, but then it's deposited in the brain, because in the, in the fatty issues, tissues. And so then, at this point, I'm not saying that, you know, it shouldn't be, but the fact remains that we should stress on, we know that it's here, so we should stress on how we can educate the public so that the public will be aware of it and not to put their, so you know, I, themselves into it. Thank That's you. Mine. Thank you, so an aggressive public education. Well, you, you. just so you know, right, um, Lawrence, we, the CAO's office is already working with the county of Los Angeles, uh, which not specializes, but 
one of their responsibilities deals with the health. It's no way you move forward with any of this without having that conversation incorporated or blended in this com conversation. So I appreciate what you have to say. If you could identify yourself, and then I want to try Yolanda, Yolanda Aldez. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, everybody. My name is Ryan Greenlaw, uh, and thank you all for you know coming here over time to do this. But to actually answer your question, I think if you were able to uh, essentially just use some of those taxes to study the efficacies of cannabis, you'd probably find that a lot of illnesses and such were being fixed with this. So as long as some money is actually being into studying that and what it does and to you know, into that, I think it would definitely do a lot to advance science and such like that. Um, but um, I'm from the south side of Chicago and I'm here because I'm uh, an aspiring uh, entrepreneur. Yeah, I said, I said, I said it's Chicago with the Cubs. Um, but uh, I learned about cannabis in college. Uh, and, and I say cannabis because that's how I was introduced there. No one was penalized from there. Uh, I think it would be a great travesty if people from all communities weren't able to benefit from this plant. Because that's all it is, is a basic plant. And where you go and where you are shouldn't dictate who gets access to it and who ac gets access to profit from it. So we need to think about that. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, Yolanda. We got to quit doing we, what we meet each other. Is it every Wednesday night? You know what? I'm just, I'm everywhere. I'm involved. I'm involved in our communities because we do care. We were just together at Canoga, Canoga, Canoga Park, Park Neighborhood Council Correct. last Wednesday, and it's good to see you again. Likewise. Thank you very much for having us here, opening this, uh, opening up this forum. Um, I'm here with UCBA. I'm also a PR and community outreach for DC Collective. We've been in business since 2007 in the city of Canoga Park. Um, and in, 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 in speaking to the ordinance that we work together with UCBA, um, you know, we, we hear a lot that we are kind of segregating a group, that we're trying to monopolize, that we're with the 1%. But honestly, if anything, I'm one of those part of those minorities. Not only am I female, I'm Latina, I'm a mother of two, I'm a college graduate, and we're very, very involved in our community. We, make, we need to make sure that our parents educate their children because it is our responsibility as parents to educate our children when it comes to this industry. Um, we have the yes and the no to our children. Um, also, we, we believe that we should be rewarded. We should, be, we, we should at least be given the opportunity to continue in this industry because we have been doing everything that we've been asked to by our city. We've paid our taxes, we've been legal, we've, been done, we've done everything. We educate our community, we volunteer, we donate to, to the food pantries. So we're very involved and we do care about our community. Okay. We need to make sure that we continue this. And those that have been here before, we are role models. We are that model that we should look, okay. be looked at. So that's all I'm asking, and I wanted to share for those that don't understand how Yolanda, thank detrimental you. it is in the community, we can be positive. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to call three names, and I'm going to get to the panel. Okay, these will be the last three public comments for right now. Okay, and then we'll listen to the panel, and then we'll take some more public comment. So do I have Lisa Salan or Salan, Jackie, is it Subek? And Jane Kaufman, please come forward. Hey. Hi. Thank you again for having everybody here tonight and for all the hard work you're doing. My name is Lisa Seelan. I am general counsel to UCBA Trade Association, which has approximately 40 of the property shops that have been working in this city since 2006 and 2007 and have tried through 2007's ordinance, 2010, 2011, and property in 2013 to do everything right. We do not want to be exclusive. To the contrary, we would like to see the community opened up for cultivation, manufacturing, dispensing, testing, and distribution so that many people of all walks can have an opportunity. But we also would like to be able to continue being um, beneficial to the communities that we have been servicing and dispensing and cultivating in their current locations, which they have been doing according to the laws and paying their taxes and paying their payroll taxes and workers' comp taxes. And that's all we're asking is that the city give these people the opportunity to stay in business. Thank you so much. Thank you. So if I could have the next speaker, just identify yourself. 
Hi, I'm Jackie Subek. I'm a vice chair of an organization called Women Grow in Los Angeles. Uh, we're educators. We, ne we have networking groups for cannabis businesses. Um, I just want to kind of echo a little bit of what she just said, um, which is that regardless, I know when you're thinking about your licensing and how many you want to issue and who you want to issue those to, there's you've got your, your prop Ds, and we're all in support of that. And then there's these other businesses, as she was just talking about, that also have really great people in them and really great, um, you know, great businesses for the community. And I, a lot of, I, in my uh, uh, journey with Women Grow, I have met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cannabis businesses around LA. And I have met some incredible people, some incredible business owners that give back, that do beach cleanups and all kinds of community services and offer programs for vets and just really get engaged. And I think we should be looking at that as well when it comes time to who to, you know, who to give, who to keep in business. I mean, we're not here to dirty this business up. We want to clean it up and also make it available for just good business owners. The fact that it's cannabis almost on some level shouldn't matter when you're thinking about that. Thank you. Okay? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi. Hey there. My name is Jane Kaufman. I do not currently have a pony in the race in LA, but I've been around the market and the businesses of cannabis in the city and around the state for quite some time. What I'm going to suggest to you when you consider your regulations is that you try and bring people into the light that have been excluded through uh, persecution and prosecution. Then instead of banning people from working at dispensaries that have drug offenses, that you look at these people and you create special programs to bring them in and give them real jobs to move forward in an industry that they've already sacrificed for. If the aim here is to shut down the black market, the only way that you're going to do that is by outreach and by bringing people in with open arms that do have a checkered past because of the industry. Uh, at the same time, when you're looking at regulation, the more you over-regulate, the more you will keep in the black market. So when you say things like, well, we're going to make you shut down at 8 p.m. at night, you're going to have people out selling on the streets until 2 in the morning. When you say things like, well, we're going to ban delivery services, you're going to have people illegally delivering all over the city. When you say we're going to ban on-site consumption, Thank you're pushing people out onto the sidewalk to light up. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you, you can be assured those are some of the very things that we want to make sure we have a serious conversation about. Okay, so now what I'd like to do, first of all, is thank each and every one of you for coming. These are members of our panel that are going to have a, you know, a conversation about a variety of things. I think everybody kind of does something slightly different. And so I'm going to ask you to identify yourself and, uh, you know, uh, indicate what it is that you do and, and what your role is tonight. So I want to start with Yana and you start. Okay, or do you want me to start with Virgil? Virgil talks like this, so it, it, no. I, <laughs> lady, go on, Yana, go on. Thank you, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming out here tonight. Um, thank you for um, to listen, to ask, and to put some input into this very important matter. My name is Yana Bakshi. I am the owner-operator of WHTC. It's a pre-ICO property compliant dispensary in Studio City. I'm also on the executive board of the greatest, Greater Los Angeles Collective Alliance, known as GLACA, which happens to be the oldest and most respected cannabis trade organization in the city of Los Angeles. I'm also on the executive board um, of the Southern California Coalition. GLACA and the Southern California Coalition has worked and continues to work with the city in order to create a solid ordinance to benefit everyone in the community and the industry in the city of Los Angeles. I will be more than happy to answer any and all questions um, that has to do with dispensaries um, and anything else I know in this industry. And I've been very involved in this for the last eight years. 
And um, I got into this industry because unfortunately cancer touched my life when my mom got sick with cancer, di got diagnosed. So um, unfortunately, this touches everyone, I'm sure in this room one way or another. And it's very important for all of us to be here to help these patients, to help the people who really, really need us. We're here to help and here to heal. Thank you. So let me ask Jared, why don't you jump in? Um, my name is Jared Kylo. Um, I'm the owner and operator of the Higher Path in Sherman Oaks. I'm also president of the UCBA Trade Association. Um, the UCBA Trade Association was formed um, because there was a vacuum that was left in regulation under dispensaries and all the other marijuana activities in Los Angeles and we banded together as Prop D shops to at least put forth what we thought was going to be good regulation for um, dispensaries. Uh, we felt like this was an important part of moving like Los Angeles forward. Uh, I've been in this industry for 16 years now. Um, I sat on the medical marijuana task force in San Francisco and helped write legislation for what is currently the still enacted legislation in San Francisco and has been for nine years. Um, I've been an uh, operator in San Francisco for 13 years, um, ran a delivery service there as well, um, and I've been inside Los Angeles for over nine years supporting numerous dispensaries here with friends and family. Um, and moved into the Prop D kind of regulation side of the dispensary model, and I've owned the higher path now for three and a half years, um, along with um, my partner, Daniel Stein. So this is something that's been really passionate for me in trying to make sure that regulations are the way that we are. That is the path to taxation, as the tax to the best ways, the best practices. I know that as we, as we work through this, we're going to try to find what are the best practices for this industry to move forward. We need to be the example. And setting the example for an industry is, uh, is someone who does follow the rules that the city and state are giving them. And Prop D shops have done that for over nine years. Um, it would be more criminal to, um, to put Prop D shops in a detrimental place to have to close their shops when they have put roots into the community. Uh, I know that I'm a member of the Chamber of Commerce, the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association, a member of VICA. Um, we are part of Weed for Warriors. We are supporters of Women's Grow. Uh, we are, I mean, I, I can sit here and tell you about how much we as a property shop, because we have the ability to stay in one place, because we're not illegal, because we're not looking over our shoulder, waiting for the police to come, we have established ourselves in this community. The community supports us. And that's the best part about this. When the Chamber of Commerce comes and gives us a, a blue ribbon to cut, it really does feel like we're part of the business community as well. We provide for patients. Um, I feel like we are one of the more um, medically based um, dispensaries in Los Angeles. We work very closely with solid tumor pediatric nurses who bring in 11-year-olds with cancer. Um, we work very closely with the UCLA Medical Center who sends not just, like they send their patients to our shop to get very specific ratio doses of our cannabis for their specific diseases. This is what a community-based dispensary can do. You can now have a doctor and a nurse send them to a very specific place because they trust you. The patients trust you, the community trusts you. This is what I feel is important. That's what UCBA put this ordinance on for the March ballot because we felt it was important that the city did something with this vacuum that was created by regulation on Prop D that left ambiguity all over the place. So I am here to push that all aspects of this industry need to be supported in a, in a good regulation. I know that UCBA had worked very closely with all city council members, and in the formation of this ordinance, we took all of, all of their opinions um, into account when we wrote this, and maybe opinions have changed, because a lot has changed in the last three months when you look at the opinions of what this industry is going to do for California, what it's gonna do for Los Angeles. Opinions have changed. And that's why we wrote into our regulation that the city council will have all the power to be able to change every aspect of the industry with the exception of lowering the number of dispensaries below 135. We feel that the industry would not be supported by only 135 
dispensaries, there'd be 400 to 500 people standing out my, outside my dispensary every day, and that would be a nuisance to my community. There is in no way that the UCBA is trying to limit the number of dispensaries or activity in Los Angeles, and our ordinance proves what we were attempting to do. The attempt is to galvanize this industry to come together to really fight for what we all need and make sure that Los Angeles stays a self-sustaining industry. We don't need outsiders from outside Los Angeles to come in here and sell whatever wares they have. We need to protect what we have here. We're a big enough community, and I think we can establish a really strong, like, self-sustaining city here in all aspects of the marijuana industry. Thank you, Jared. So I want to go down to Misty. Hi, I'm Misty Wilkes. I am a educator, entrepreneur, and a federal attorney licensed in a few states and a community activist. Um, I've been forced to say over the last three years in speaking about this that I am not anti-marijuana in any way, but I have noticed that the number of dispensaries in my specific community, which is Lamarck Park and Baldwin Hills, has had a particular impact on our community. And I just want to have a voice so that the communities have a voice of how the communities themselves are being impacted. Um, we've had dispensaries that have been disrespectful of our neighborhood, that have left trash on our streets, that have operated blatantly illegally. I've had friends from the east side tell me, oh, I'm coming to that spot on this corner because they don't even require a wreck at all in any way. They're just illegally dealing drugs. So we're largely um, concerned about enforcement, education, um, even access to entry for the community if they are going to be allowed in our communities, are our communities going to be allowed to benefit from the dispensaries? Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, there's, there's a lot more than that, of course, but we're just trying to lessen the negative impacts that the dispensaries will have in specific communities. Those of you, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. Those of you that were here in the 90s may remember that there was a time when certain communities were plagued with pawn shops, liquor stores, pawn shop, liquor store, pawn shop, liquor store. And we spent a lot of time limiting the number of pawn shops and liquor stores that could be allowed to open in our communities because it was having a detrimental impact. And I just want to make sure that it does not continue. At some point in the last two years, we had 12 dispensaries in a two block distance between Martin Luther King and Stocker um, on Crenshaw. It, it, we cannot have pawn shop dispensary marijuana chicken, pawn shop dispensary marijuana chicken. Um, with, with all the money leaving the community, with nothing being put into education, I too saw the 60 minute um, the episode on Sunday and was concerned. I've had conversations with 14 and 15 year olds who are consuming marijuana and don't understand the detrimental impact that it has on them. So I think education needs to be a huge part of this. What I thought, what, I, what came to mind for me when I was watching the 60 minute episode and trying to figure out how to educate our children, those of us that are old enough remember the egg commercial with the skillet, this is your brain on eggs. We're going to have to create something that is visual so that our children understand that if you're under the age of 25, this is having a detriment, detrimental impact on your, on your, on your brain development. Um, and I just want to make sure these types of things are included in this conversation. You know, I just want to jump in and thank you. I know, you know, she was, uh, I want to say in Florida. Yes. Cut. <laughs> I apologize for being late. I was no, in Florida no. this morning with no ticket to Los Angeles. No, she <laughs> cut her trip short to make sure that she could be here with us today. And it's my understanding that you came directly, came directly. from the airport. And we, we, we really appreciate that commitment because this, that's what this conversation is all about. Uh, I want to hear from you and I want the folk in the industry to hear from you. That's the only way we have a shot at trying to come up with something as, as everyone participates. Zachary, you're up. You're on the clock. Uh, <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Zachary Pitts. I'm with the Los Angeles Delivery Alliance and the Southern California Coalition. Uh, I also run with my mother, in fact, uh, a delivery service. Um, 
I think right now we're, we're really looking um, for a space in licensing that allows uh, businesses that aren't just uh, the property compliant shops, as much as they've provided for the city, provided for the patients um, tremendous services. Uh, I think there's a lot of sp room for delivery services. I think there's a lot of room for cultivators, for manufacturers uh, to provide those those jobs, those tax revenues, and to fill those spaces that can't necessarily be uh, filled by the property shops. Um, some people are just too sick. Uh, some people don't want to sit in traffic. Um, and so I think uh, Prop D was kind of passed um, when there wasn't any guidance from the state, when there wasn't a good way to regulate and it was the best thing that we could come up with. Uh, but now we have a state law, we have the AUMA, um, and I think, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, potential to meet the needs of the local community, and there's a lot of potential to really prosper. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So uh, if I can now call on Virgil. Good evening. My name is Virgil Grant. I'm one of the oldest owners and operators in uh, the industry, been around since 2001, 2002. I've had the first uh, shop in the history of this industry south of the 10 freeway. Um, I've been a former member of Glocka, founder of uh, Glocka, uh, sit on the board of Cultivators Alliance, but most of all, I'm a co-founder of California Minority Alliance. California Minority Alliance was created to represent the minority in the cannabis industry who was being underrepresented. So uh, Donnie and myself, Donnie Anderson and myself, uh, we co-founded California Minority Alliance to uh, speak to that minority voice and space that should be represented in the cannabis industry. Um, and also, with that being said, we, uh, uh, when we speak about good practices and, and, and operating in, in a uh, positive manner, I was here before there were any regulations. Um, we self-regulated. That's what a lot of us were founded on as owners and operators. We sp respected the communities that we operated in, and, and our, we were good neighbors good operators, uh, and so on and so forth. The reason that there is a ICO to this day were people like myself who started back in the early days. The reason why there is even a Prop D that exists are for people like myself who operated back in the early days. Um, so when we talk about Los Angeles and what Los Angeles should look like, this is what Los Angeles should look like. Uh, I've been a, I've been a Angelino for mm, 30, 48 years. I'm sorry, just had a birthday, 49 years. So I've been here from day one. Been in this industry from the very beginning, on and operating and using best practices. Um, I appreciate uh, the council for taking the time to uh, open this forum up for us to be able to communicate with the communities that have concerns. I appreciate my colleagues here to my right who have uh, invested just as much as I, I've, that I've invested within the industry and still investing more, still putting time into the communities, communities that we operate and function around and in, still giving back to the communities. I like what a lot of my colleagues said about giving back. That's what we're about, giving back, giving to, uh, making sure that we can do things within our community, help with the homeless, feed the homeless, feed those who just aren't fortunate enough to feed themselves. We do a lot of community outreach. We work with local churches. We work with local community groups. Uh, we do all of this. So um, there are people in this industry, and let's be very clear, they are good actors and bad actors in every industry. Uh, just understand that we are the good actors of this industry, and we want to see Los Angeles have nothing but good actors in this industry. This industry has been a mess. I'll be the first to say that, and it needs to be cleaned up, and that's why we are working. The coalition is working closely with uh, 
city council, and the community to make sure that they, we reach that goal. Uh, community lean, leaders and community people uh, within the city, we are asking for you to work with us because we're willing to work with you. Just as we reached our arms uh, out to the city to work with them. We want to see a better LA. We want to clean up the face of medical cannabis in the city of Los Angeles. And recreation was right around the corner. Uh, so we need to get this done pretty quick. We don't have a lot of time to waste. Uh, I know it's a concern for the community, but keep in mind for someone who has put a lot on the line for this industry, it's more of a concern to me for this uh, industry to look like it should. Well regulated, licensing, and enforcement. In that, in that manner, we need licensing because that separates the difference between who is and who isn't. There's no black and white. I mean, it's black and white. There's no gray area in that. It's licensing, non-licensing. Then there's a, a, a good regulatory framework, which the council is definitely working on. Uh, and to have that regulatory framework work for the community as well as the cannabis community. And then enforcement. I know we all love to have that. Enforcement. Let's get rid of the bad actors within the community so people like ourselves can shine. Thank you. Okay. You know, I just want to take a moment because I don't want to just keep the panel here for the, the, the rest of the, the hearing or, or, or ask you to get too engaged. But Misty said something where related to liquor stores and pawn shops and how there was an effort by community people to try to limit the number and what have you. And, and I get that and I agree with that, but when I think about liquor stores and pawn shops in the community I represent, I think about people who do not live in the community that come into the community and run these businesses. So in the event, or as we move forward, I wanted to get your thoughts and you guys can just jump in. How can we ensure that it is diverse? I don't want people to come here and make a fortune off of people that live here with the people that live here not afforded the opportunity to financially benefit as well. So I just would like thoughts on diversity and how does one do that? Miss, do you want to jump in? I actually thought about this um, and not not getting into the whether there should be more than 135 or not, but however that's decided, if perhaps if there are any more loud in a specific district or a specific neighborhood, that there's some sort of preference the same way there is with MBE and small and women owned businesses and, and things of that nature so that if you're community based, if it's a community based collective or a community based something, um, and the people, the owners are residents of that neighborhood and that community, perhaps something could be worked out that way um, where maybe there's an exception, a point preference or something. I haven't thought it all the way through, but I did think that perhaps there should be something where communities are allowed to start businesses if they want to be able to start a business in their well, neighborhood. Well, I want the community to think about that because I want recommendations from the communities. But why don't you guys, just whoever wants to jump in. Yes. Who, I, who, who, Virgil, you, you go ahead. You. Yes, um, and, and, and I love what she said. Uh, majority of the communities that I operated are the communities that I come from. Um, my mother stays right maybe two blocks away from my collective. Uh, so I'm definitely in the community that I operate in. I mean that, my, that we live in. Um, I think that coming from the California Minority Alliance perspective, uh, I would love to see more minority representation within the cannabis community, not as employees, because we just don't want to be employees. We want to be owners and operators too. We want to be able to take part in a ownership so position how, Virgil, of this industry. How, would some, how, how do you ensure that? I'm just, again. This equity, equity state. It has to be an equity licensing 
Um, just as Oakland was attempting to do the equity licensing where minority communities had a set aside of 51%, uh, 50 plus one uh, percent equity stake within the licensing system. Okay. So um, who else wants to jump, Jared? Yeah. I know that we've discussed in our group about um, how do we ensure access, and uh, I know that I work in another industry. I work, um, I have a birth center in Northern California, and I was trying to find a way to um, work with the community to kind of tell them what does this industry do, and we worked really closely with the community colleges and had um, other midwives who were kind of teaching to the community about what their industry stood for, and so we created a program that went from midwives to teach classes about that kind of education and we feel like we had the um, we had the idea that we could take a lot of our owners who could to could go to this community college and start to teach how do you run a dispensary because this isn't just a small business this is going to be a huge regulatory like like mess if you're going to jump into this without some background and understanding how to run a business is going to be really important and this education side of things is going to be the most important part that we can do and the people who know how to run these industries and these businesses are going to have to pass that education down and that's that's how we feel the best way that we can empower them because if we just throw any business at any person that it's going to be difficult to run a business without the understanding so as we can give better understandings about how to run these businesses we really can set them up to succeed and that's the that's the point of this and that's what CMA does uh, California Minority Alliance has a training system to help people uh, uh, we train people to run collectives, to own collectives, not just be uh, a bud tender or a security guard, but we also teach people how to get involved in the industry. We're also partnered up with a, a financial institution for those who need financial assistance in opening up or starting up a business. We make sure that we connect the dots within our community so that's a possibility for someone who doesn't have the financial wherewithal. Okay, I wanted to see if somebody else wanted to jump in and then if you have a question or two, Mr. Harris Dawson, but did anybody else want to tackle that? In fact, then I jump. So I, I just had a, a detailed question about the set aside uh, notion and, and um, I share the sentiments of the, the chair um, around watching industry after industry, idea after idea, say, oh, we want diversity, oh, we're gonna train people, oh, we're gonna bring people in, and you fast forward five years later, and you have the same exact makeup in that industry as you had in any other. We're dealing with this right now with this yeah. it relates to um, yeah. trash hauling. I mean, it's something as simple as that. Um, so the set aside uh, that you talked about, can you talk a little bit more about what Oakland was trying to do and, and uh, how it might work here in Los Angeles? Um, Oakland had set, they set aside half, 50% of the licensing uh, that they issued or that they were issuing in Oakland to the minority communities. The communities, they used police beats, but it was the community that had been negatively impacted on, you know, negatively impacted by the war on drugs. People who did have felonies were able to now apply for licensing within the, uh, those particular police beats, which were predominantly the minority community. Um, but the, the uh, person that was applying for that license had to own 51% of the business in that licensing scheme. And I understand how, you know, we think uh, how someone can be financed out of that situation, uh, but that's the reason why we uh, make sure we connect the dots with uh, financial institutions that are willing to fund minorities to get involved so that they can keep hold to their stake that they own within the cannabis community. Excellent. And then, and then one more uh, question, if the chair will indulge me. Um, back to this uh, idea of over-concentration, you know, certainly I appreciate your story on Martin Luther King. That's, that's true on Martin Luther King. It's true on Western. It's true on Normandy. It's true, true on, on Robertson. It's true, true on, on almost, it's, it's true on Venice. It's, you know, it's, it's true so many places around the, the um, city. Um, I, I'm just wondering what the ideas for enforcement are. So even your collective 
uh, which I think I'm, I'm pretty sure I know where that is, you're in a situation where at any given time there might be five other shops on, your, on the block that your collective is on. <laughs> and, and from the community point of view, we can't tell which one is the right one. I, I mean, you know, I don't go in them, so I don't know which one is the right one and which one is not. I just know, you know, well, usually, I'll get a report that there's a shooting in front of one, and then mm -hmm. there's a robbery in front of another one, mm -hmm. and then there are people hanging out at 2 in the morning at another one, and I, I, you know, it's hard from a community point of view to make sense of that. Well, usually if you drive by at uh, 8 o'clock, and if they're still open, then you know they are not the legal ones because <laughs> we shut down at 8 o'clock. Um, and the, what I explained in the very beginning is that we take away the gray area. There's so much gray area right now without a, a good regulatory system and a licensing framework or a licensing scheme. Once you have a license, then you know who's good and who's not. There aren't any rogue liquor stores so, because a liquor store has a license. And so you know who, where that license is and who has that license. And it should be considered the same way with the Medical Cannabis Collective, license. We operate under a limited immunity ban. That's not licensing. That's a BTRC that says Medical Marijuana Collective on it. But let, let's try to make it real clear. License, no license. Now you know who to go get. And, and Anybody to else to, want to jump? Zachary? Yeah, to add to that, I mean, y you may not be able to see figure out which are the rogue shops and which are the, uh, the Prop D shops, but it seems like the city attorney can't even figure that out. And with that licensing scheme, that really, that just makes it so easy. You have clear regulations um, that we know how to follow, and then uh, the people who aren't following them can be very clearly designated and taken out. Okay, I want to, yeah, go, go on. Um, I also think that the problem starts with landlords. And this is who you should target first, because uh, landlords speaking are to the, the mic. Yeah, yeah. Landlords are the people who rent these places out for a lot more money than any other business, and they know exactly who's supposed to be there and who is not. So, if a landlord would face fines, or would even think that possibly his property could be taken away, I think they would deal with the situation differently. You know, I've never heard that before. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I knew there were problems with the landlords, but I never knew that they, okay. Okay, I want uh, just a couple quick other ones. Who, who wants to talk about, I don't know, Jared, if it's you or if it was Zachary. Zachary, maybe it was you, delivery business. Yeah. Why don't we talk, what, what is the delivery business? So the way that most delivery services work, or at least the ones that I associate with, um, we, we have set up kind of a, a, a set of best practices. We have a, a single location um, in which we accept orders uh, either through a website or when people call in. Um, we verify uh, their recommendation with their doctor's office. Uh, we take down the order. We send out the, only the specific order that they've ordered and the money that, we might, that our drivers might need to produce change, and we just deliver it directly to them. Um, we, a, lot of, a lot of our standards are about you know, protecting patient privacy, protecting um, our driver, uh, making sure that they're secure, and doing a lot of steps of verification to make sure that we're not sending it. Um, like we would never send it to you know, a street corner. We'd send it to a specific address, to a home address. Uh, we'd send it to and hand it only over to the specific patient that called us. Um, so I think under uh, uh, a regulatory system set up by the state and by the city, uh, it would be pretty simple to you know audit um, our sales, to uh, come into our our location and make sure that there's uh, we're following all the, any rules that the city finds necessary make sure that there's no nuisance. And, and that's one of the nice things about delivery services is um, while storefronts definitely have their place, uh, delivery services, uh, they're not having people, you know, standing outside. They're not having, uh, uh, they're not having those big signs or anything like that that might cause a nuisance, not necessarily, but that may. And so uh, 
Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for the city to service its population, to service the patients that really need it um, without, uh, without creating too many stores on street corners. You know, the, there used to be, and, and, and he, the business is coming back into the community, it was a restaurant called Stevie's on the Strip. Yeah. And they had the best <laughs> gumbo, right? Yeah. And I used to go there on a regular basis to get this gumbo. And every time I went, the taste was almost identical or, you know, real close. Let's say in one of your stores, how can your clients or customers know that when they come to your store that they're going to get something that doesn't have paint chips in it or what I mean how how do you do that how how does a person know what it is that they're getting I mean as a delivery service it is a little bit more difficult than a shop we do I know yeah because the you it's harder for the uh the patient to see and smell uh the product before they they receive it um so in some ways, we, we kind of have to hold ourselves to an even higher standard. We have to really make sure that we never create a problem. If a patient does have a problem, we have to rectify it as quickly as we can. Um, but a lot of that also, uh, what's, what's, what we're so excited about, the state law, the MCRSA, and possibly the AUMA um, passing, is that um, it, allows, uh, it allows standards of cultivation um, regulated by the Department of Ag or the uh, you know, the State Department of Agriculture, um, so each every bud that's sold is uh, insured is tested is ensured that it doesn't have um, harmful pesticides used uh, and is safe, um, and it can be traced back to that cultivator as well. And a lot of cultivators follow best practices, but some you know aren't. And this. The state law will really ensure that the, that kind of protections for the consumers are in place. Um, we can then have branded uh, uh, buds, we can have branded flour that customers can know that, and patients can know that, oh, this is a farmer that I trust, I really like their stuff, so when I get it again, it's going to be consistent. And right now we try to do that, we try to identify the farmer, um, but uh, it's going to be even better under the state system. Go ahead, uh, Jared. Um, delivery in most cities can encompass close to half of the entire industry. And this does give patients access who can't actually leave their homes. And when you have places like Yelp and stuff, you do see reviews. You are held accountable in a social media and a social kind of setting. So if you are a one and done kind of delivery company where all you do is deliver paint chips, well, everyone's going to know. The accountability is there. Mm -hmm. and, and a great regulatory system that allows this kind of access throughout the city is really going to be important so that we don't have 300 people standing outside of a dispensary waiting for it. We can deliver to their homes and give them that kind of access. I think this is important. And we've, we've dealt with insurance companies when it comes to cars and how do you lease, do you lease or buy? Or, and, and so there is this insurance now that's insuring our drivers, insuring our cars, because this is, this is a business and we are giving access to people that is just so important now because we can't all get on the 405 and try to get somewhere. We do want to have that kind of access. That's why a lot of these delivery services, even for food, are, 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 are popping up in the city because we do want to be able to stay in our homes, work the way we want to, and be able to kind of take three minutes to answer the door, take that process, uh, on and then collect your medicine and go about your life, whether especially if you're in a kind of your own home business. So okay. I feel it's really important. Misty? I want to recommend to the council president um, three websites, uh, two of whom I learned about at a city hall hearing. Um, one of the councilmen said there's no way we can't find the illegal dispensaries because they all advertise on weedmaps.com, leafly.com, and Yelp. 
And also, and I, I knew about Zach long before I'd ever met him because the delivery services are advertised. I understand that Santa Monica went through a lot of effort to eliminate the number of dispensaries and that they're heavily, they heavily rely on delivery services, that they can charge a premium, and that everyone does go online and write reviews. So if you're delivering bad product, like you said, you will not stay in business long. But those are three websites that I think everyone that's looking into this issue should look into. Is it safe for your your drivers? I mean, definitely. Uh, we're we're verifying the identity of anyone who's ordering from us. Um, so we we get an image of their ID. We um, get their recommendation, which we then use uh, to verify with the doctor's office. Sometimes they have automated services. Sometimes we can we have to call in to make sure, and we make sure that 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 name is matching the recommendation. Um, and then we're delivering to a specific address. Uh, we're not delivering um, to to some random place that they say. And we're we're limiting um, what the drivers have on them, so that there's not really an incentive uh, um, for any bad actors to try to steal from the drivers. Because you know, we work with these people every day. We don't we we would never want to see them hurt, and so we do our utmost to protect them. Okay, but Virgil, before I come back, I want to ask one other question. Then I've got to, uh, I've got to get through these uh, cards, and I might have to uh, leave you to close it out. But I want to get through every card. But I, I, two things came up. We had Jane Kaufman. If Jane's still here, she may have left. There, very impressive. I, I, I listening to you. And she talked about if you do this, you're going to, you know. And then I, I can't remember if it was Lawrence, but we two s smells came up, right? <laughs> Smell concerns and uh, uh, using the product on the premises. Why do people have to use it on the premises? So just somebody jump in. I mean, and I get Jane where, where Jane is coming from, but I'm just, I'm just asking, I want to ask you guys, and I, wanna, I don't want you to fight, but I want to start, since Virgil, you were going to get the last one, I'm going to start with you. Maybe that's something that would help us understand, because when I go out, and I'm sure when Marquise goes out, a lot of people talk about folk in the parking lot, and it looks kind of unsavory, individuals, you know, smoking joints or what have you. And I'm just, help me understand that. Well, testing, let me, um, I just want to just say that one thing. Mandatory testing ensures safe product. Okay. So that talks well, about that. Um, going to the smell, uh, one, we don't do on-site consumption. Uh, which we don't allow people to consume medicine on site. That's one of our rules. Uh, on our rules sheet, when they uh, sign in as a patient, they have to sign to, and we enforce the rules of our collective. Um, no on site consumption. Medicine is supposed to remain in your trunk until you reach final destination. No consuming from point A to point B. Uh, these are the rules that we enforce, and if someone breaks those rules, then there's penalties, 30-day uh, uh, ban from the facility and then revocation of your membership, which means you can't come back anymore. Then you need to find another collective that may put up with that, but we don't. So people like myself, and I know my colleagues may have different rules, but I'm sure they're not too far off from that, but we enforce those rules because let's, it protects the community. Cool. Let's hear from the, uh, your colleagues. Jared, did you want to jump in or did Zach? Somebody had their hand up to yeah. answer. Yeah, Let's so go ahead. I'll let Misty go first. She says. We'll go. We'll go. I, I want to hear you guys and then I'll go. Sure. Um, when you talk about now you can't smoke in your own apartment, um, you can't smoke in a dispensary, uh, where are you going to smoke? And this becomes the problem is we are pushing people onto the streets because they don't know where to go. I mean, there is no open containers because we have bars. You go to a bar and you drink at a bar because that's where you're going to socialize. That's where you're going to consume. So they and, smoke on site at well, your place? No, that's illegal under Prop D. 
I mean, so oh, no. I, didn't, I'm, I don't want to get you in trouble. No, 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 no. There, there, there is You're no, under arrest. <laughs> there, there I don't want to no, get you in trouble. There is no on-site consumption, but when you brought up the, when she brought up the fact that we are pushing people out to the streets, do we have on-site consumption? And I think we should because there are so many apartment buildings that don't allow you to smoke within your own building. So then you walk down to what? Your parking lot and that's where you smoke either your cigarettes or your joints. It's like we need to make sure that there is a safe place to and smoke. And I get that. Yeah. I get that. But there needs to be a balance with when you, as, we get, as we get further into this process, I believe that you're going to hear a lot of folk from the community raise that as a concern and again it's in the event that we find a place where we all can go everybody's going to have to make adjustments i'm not saying that this is one but i i i you know there are still a lot of apartments where you can smoke sure i mean and if and if you're in a region where the the community is just upset with that I mean, there should be a real conversation about that. I can speak from like a construction sort of standpoint. We talk about HVAC systems. We can create a low pressure system with carbon filters where air cannot leak out of the building. So if you are smoking or like we do for cultivation, we do have a low pressure system which draws air in from the outside and all the air that leaves the building goes through a carbon filter. That carbon filter. Hey, what do they do in Colorado where it's recreation? I go to your joint, I buy, I go to your, I don't mean joint, I go to your place. <laughs> <laughs> and I buy so what are they like little vamp clubs or whatever where you can I mean it's a recreational use I'm curious yeah I mean that is the recreational use it's the kind where you can sit around and socialize like you would at any sort of coffee house okay. well instead of drinking coffee you're smoking a joint gotcha. and and to really keep that from emanating into the community onto the streets there's real easy HVAC practices that can kind of create that low pressure system to keep things filtered and to keep the smell from leaking into the street. So there's, there's definitely ways we can do that and we have. I mean, if you, our cultivation side of this is like, that's a big part of the way that we hmm. stay, like keep smell from going into the community. So, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not a difficult practice. And, and if we created regulations that required a certain number of CFMs or, or cubic feet per minute of air being drawn out of the building, we'd be able to create a standard that would be, you have a 10 by 10 space. So it's 10 by 10 plus 8 feet tall. We know how many cubic feet that is. Now, if you have a fan that's drawing that many cubic feet per minute out of the building, we'd be able to know that there's that much air is being exchanged and there's no way for that smell to get out because every, every time that fan is going it's pulling all of that air through that carbon filter well you know well, I do believe this is well, the big this is the beginning of this this conversation we're going to be going for years probably but I want to if you had another question and I want to get to the uh, Missy had a comment on this one I would okay I actually was going to say almost exactly what he said and just about the HVAC system and just to differentiate between on-site consumption and outside consumption, which are two completely different gotcha. things. We would prefer on-site consumption than outside consumption. But if you, again, go on one of those websites, there are places that advertise like sports bars where you can sit down and consume and watch TV, a game. You I, need to hire her, I think her, it's Jared. similar to Amsterdam. Sorry. <laughs> I would prefer that than you standing outside of my no, I office get that. every day. I get, I get that, Yana. I agree and I disagree because um, if a patient comes into your dispensary right now, it takes them five, ten minutes, they get what they want, they're out. If you start doing consumption in a dispensary, that will create, it'll be such a nuisance to everybody around. So maybe, we're, this is down the line, maybe we will have you know, clubs or sports yeah. clubs or whatever facilities just for that. But I don't think that, you know, medicating. And maybe you're right. Maybe that's a separate thing. And, and we'll talk thing. about that more. Well, like but, liquor stores, you can't consume when you buy a bottle of exactly. liquor at a liquor store. You have to go to a bar where yeah, there's you only don't, consumption. You don't know where I go, Jerry. No. <laughs> do do, do, do you want to tell me? Let, <laughs> me get, let me get Hal, Lewis, John, Donovan, Debbie, I can't quite make out that last name. What do you think that is? Gron. Yep, that's it, Gron. And uh, 
Linda Whit Whitting or Whiting. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I've been, I've been at many of these meetings. Yes. And the one thing I want to bring out right now is there's over 1,250 dispensaries in the city of L.A. right now. There's, over 100, there's about 135 pre-ICOs. Not all of the 1,250 are bad, and not all of the 135 are good. And that's one thing my mom taught me. You have to look at everything and bring everything in right now to find out who the good people are. I mean, I started in, I mean, I had my first detainment in 1978 at the Federal Westwood Building, uh, petitioning for Norm. I own a small delivery service, and I don't mind saying that, for the entertainment industry, mostly retirees. Uh, we send a nurse practitioner out to do intakes with them. You know, we spend a half hour each time sitting down with them. We're not in it for the money. We're in it to help people. Mm -hmm. Those are the good actors. I know there's some sitting up there. I know there's some in the audience. Please look at all of us. Thank you. Okay, and that's a good point, and I remember you saying that. So next. My name is John Donovan, hey. and uh, I wanted to say thank you, Missy, for being here. I, I echo what you said earlier. Um, I think uh, I live in an area out right off Pico. It's been called the Green Mile. Yes. Okay. Proliferation of, of shops. I would like to have the communities where these shops are coming in have a real say in limiting how many so there isn't a proliferation and a density issue with that. And I would like to have it stay with the Prop D compliance, 135. And I would like to, be, the regulation is really important because we have shops that in their name, it says Prop D compliant as part of their name and they're not, they're bad players. So being able to really get rid of the bad players and keep the good players. And I know that you, I've heard some wonderful things from the people up here on the board. I mean, on the panel, but um, I haven't seen any good players in my community so far. I don't see anybody giving out food or doing these things, giving back to the community. So, and I'd also like to see them be at least a thousand feet apart from each store because that again eliminates, or at least helps with the density. Thank you. Okay, and I appreciate you coming in. Next. Hi, I'm Debbie Gaughan, and there, uh, the oh. advocates here are very well-oiled machine and are very well versed in their pitch and um, so I'm just a resident and who lives in your council district council president I see your address yes yes um, so in four you blocks, might live with that other guy that I might, I might. You <laughs> might I don't know if don't not tell. I can hook you up <laughs> don't take it off my time um, so in four blocks we've had six businesses and doesn't trump you but now it's down to four blocks or four in three blocks and we definitely feel the negative impact. So yeah. um, I would also just echo that the numbers be kept at 135 and to increase the distance to 1,000 feet because that does help with the lead, um, lessening the impact in my mind. And also the big thing is I've been to the courthouse nine times, the medical marijuana courthouse, and there's one courthouse, one judge, and I have learned so much and I want to write a book of everything I learned about life I learned in marijuana court because it's crazy. And the main thing is to pinpoint sensitive sites and have these available uh, when they give the permits so that the that people who are given the permits to these places know, have it on their record where these sensitive sites are because it shouldn't be a battle fought in the courthouse when the sensitive sites are there. That's, yeah. Thank you. I want to thank you. Thank, uh, thank you and John. I really want to thank all of the community people for coming in, and I hope to have even more community people at the next time. So I really appreciate that, because it's important that, that the industry people really, really hear this. Yes. Good evening. Linda Whiting, live in the 10th District for hey. over 30 years, retired teacher. Um, I uh, support the idea of keeping limiting the number of shops to 135 and also increasing the distance from 600 feet to 1,000 between shops and shops and uh, sensitive areas with children. And um, thank you very much for your time. No, thank you. So if I could get R.W. Akil, oh, is that yeah, R.W. Akil, Tut Hayes, Yvonne Alette, <laughs> Tangy Daniel. Misty. Yes. Oh, hey, nice. man. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> I didn't recognize you. I, I, I say something to Misty because I've seen her as, as, as from a little girl up until now, you know? But anyhow, hemp is hip. That's what we represent. We do the Million Marijuana March. 
We've been, uh, my sister, the late Samaya Kambui, was the uh, protagonist, uh, uh, the, the, the pusher of that. Thank you for pushing that, yes. Um, I probably am the only one in the history of LA that went and picked up uh, marijuana from the LAPD uh, evidence lockers, only to have us be raided there, uh, uh, six months later by uh, Detective Arthur MacArthur. Um, there is a spiritual component to marijuana that I have not heard anybody mention. Shashat. S-E-S-H-A-T, please look that up, write that down. S-E-S-H-A-T, it's been, it's been around for thousands of years, literally, from the valley of the Nile. And that symbol on, on, on her hat, that they, I mean, on, on, in her, her crown, that they say they don't know what it is, it is a marijuana leaf. Why? Because she was the one that measured the sacred temples. She was the priest and priestesses of, 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 of the temple of Shashat, did the layout of all of the sacred places. Uh, and her rope was a marijuana rope. The most, uh, how, how would you say, it's the strongest natural fiber in the world. And that is an aspect of marijuana production that needs to be looked at. Not just okay. smoking it, but okay. eating it and okay. getting the oil out of the seed. All that right. Is not okay. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hayes, Ted Hayes. This is about educating black kids. We can't educate them, so let's entertain them. So they have a proposal to turn Markham Junior High School into a motion picture theater. The diploma from Crenshaw High School wasn't worth the paper it was printed on because Crenshaw lost its accreditation. Compton College was taken under control of El Camino College and direction of El Camino College. Martin Luther King Jr. Hospital, Martin Diamond said it was so bad it was beyond medical description and it was closed for six years. What you have to know is the prisons and the jails are full of black people. And you want to talk about what Michael Jackson said, we're the party people, take that nine to five and hang it on the wall. There's a poster all through the black community saying summer jobs for kids, bilingual, mandatory. We lost the promise zone. We didn't bring it back. Community coalition didn't help us get the promise zone. And you're okay. talking about doping Thank us you. up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Yvonne Ellett, yes. I'm a Baldwin Hills resident, and I am here as representing myself in my community. Um, we do a cleanup every week, every month, and we clean up across the street from Kennethon Park in the Dons. And what we find during that cleanup is the aftermath of medical marijuana shops along Crenshaw Boulevard. And we can tell how many are open by the quantity of trash that we pick up and the type of trash that we pick up including containers. So we see fast food wrappers. We see condoms. We see all kinds of stuff that when you want to invite kids to a community cleanup that you have to kind of say, well, sorry, your kids can't help. Um, this is going to go through. So my request, my personal request, is that you treat this like a fast food ban on our communities, that you do set aside X amount of shops per area um, so that we don't have the disrespect, um, that you use the funding that you get um, from the taxes for DARE programs in our elementary schools, and that you recognize that our communities want retail spaces used for sit-down restaurants and for vital retail not to have Crenshaw Boulevard completely consumed by medical marijuana stores after Thank the you. Crenshaw line opens. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay, and, and then I, after you, I want Akili, uh, Carlos Della Torre, David Sparer. Yes. Hello, Mr. President. Hello, Council. My name is Tanjanika. I am not only a um, cannabis entrepreneur, but I'm also a Marine Corps veteran. And I take this um, medication, thank you, I take this medication, um, it's, bas it's basically saved my life, my life, honestly. So I approach you guys asking you not only to make sure that 
veterans and not only other patients have access to this medicine via delivery services and other aspects, but I also want to make sure that minorities have a stake in this and we are present and accounted for. And not only present and accounted for, we make sure that we keep data and statistics, knowing who is an entrepreneur, a minority entrepreneur in this space, and who employs minorities in this space as well. So that's what I learned in the military. I would also encourage everyone to look up the endocannabinoid system because I'm seeing a lot of, I'm hearing a lot about cannabis that isn't true. And like the gentleman said, it's been written on Egyptian papyri. This is the oldest consumed medicine. 88,000 people die a year from alcohol consumption. Not one has died from cannabis. So Got thank it. you. Wow. Akili. Mr. President and City Council Member, uh, I'm with the Institute of the Black World 21st Century, and we are focusing on ending the war on drugs. And we have been working with uh, your counterparts in Oakland to look at how they got into equity. And I want to talk about equity. They did two things. One, they looked at the ACLU and Drug Policy Alliance statistics on the number of arrests in a particular area and tied that to how they could make sure there was equity in the licensing process to make sure that the people in those communities could have shops. Secondly, they developed a citizen's commission that was the first line of accountability. So I would ask you to, to do two things. One, get in touch with city council member uh, Desley Brooks, who has some very good ideas and a very good vision about the concept of equity. And thirdly, I would ask, or secondly rather, I would ask that we look at and focus in and write in the concept of equity as we look at the licensing enforcement uh, process. So thank you. Thank you. So if I can get Carlos, David, and then Joy. I saw Joy earlier. There she is. Yes, sir. Good evening, folks. Carlos De La Torre, owner and operator of Cornerstone Research Collective in Eagle Rock, California, and also uh, a, an executive member of the board of the UCBA. Uh, Cornerstone was founded 10 years ago on the principles of creating an environment for science and research of medical cannabis. I think we're probably the only shop like that in Los Angeles. Um, we helped create the ICO like these members were talking about. Um, Councilman Zine and Councilman Jose Huizar were sending us advanced copies in 2009 and we helped them create that ICO um, that basically Prop D was, was, uh, was written on. Um, we are the first dispensary to sign a collective bargaining agreement with the United Food Workers, local 770 union here in Los Angeles. And um, like some of our members here, our intake process, someone else was talking about it, is about 30 minutes long. Um, we really emphasize the science and medical research of cannabis. Most of our patients are much older. And for us, that's really um, where the rubber meets the road. It's really what we're all talking about here first. And I think it's quite important that we remember that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is David Sparer. I, uh, I am the COO of The Clear. We're a concentrate company based in Los Angeles. I also represent the Manufacturers Alliance, and I am a proud member of the Southern California Coalition. Um, we strive daily to produce high-quality medic medicines to provide to dispensaries uh, for patients. We have direct relations with a number of doctors, regular doctors, neurologists, and, and oncologists, and we, we produce uh, specific formulations which are delivered through dispensaries to these patients to treat specific conditions. Interestingly, one of them is my son, who is, has epilepsy, has had it since he's two. Since medical cannabis uh, was legalized, he's now taking um, not THC, CBD, and he doesn't have seizures anymore. So that's what got me into the business. Um, we are for, um, stand for uh, um, respect, respectful and responsible licensing, regulation, and when people talk about Angelinos, we are Angelinos. We live here, we work here, we support our neighborhood, and we intend to continue to do so as long as you folks see fit. Thank you. Thank you. So if I could get Joy and then Stephen, Stephen Burt, and uh, Matt Garland. Yes, so hey. Joy Enix, I am the president of the South Los Angeles Alliance of Neighborhood Councils, and I want to thank you guys, the committee, for having a hearing in South LA-ish. Um, <laughs> I'll leave that there. Um, we, as a neighborhood council and stakeholders, we have a lack of trust in the city to be able to enforce nuisance, nuisance businesses uh, and commercial properties down. So I would like to 
see that you guys get ahead of this and make sure that the taxes that are used, LAPD has the resources, as if they don't have enough, um, that they need to be able not to give excuses of why they can't do what we need them to do when we know that businesses are illegal. And I'd also like to see that legal licensed businesses are provided in some capacity to neighborhood councils, because if anybody is gonna be hawkish and make sure they're, be, they're taken care of and doing what they're supposed to do and not doing what they're not supposed to do, it should be neighborhood councils. Right. So okay. right now, I can tell you where every illegal neighborhood uh, uh, dispensary is in my neighborhood council. And I'd be also be able to tell you guys the legal ones if we had one. Mm -hmm. uh, and have a relationship with LAPD and any enforcement agency, czar, whatever it looks like, it would kind of limit some of the, the ambiguity okay. and help stakeholders to feel like they're a part of this process especially the ones that are against it. All right. So. Okay, thanks for coming. It's always a pleasure. It's a joy to see you, and I really appreciate your service to this city. Yes, sir. How are you doing? My name is Steve Burt. Um, I'm an attorney, and I uh, wanted two things I want to comment on. I represent a chain of uh, hydro shops, and I just want to bring that up to say that outside of actually dealing with the particular product of medical or recreational marijuana, there are other industries that will also benefit from this and provide jobs and, and things in the community. Also want to say that um, a lot of the negative comments I hear are related to the activities of illegal shops, and I want people to keep on their mind that that is one of the reasons why regulation is so important, because you eliminate those people. When you have a person that has a license, they have a stake in it, they have a vested interest in making sure that they're good community citizens, and we wouldn't see some of the same uh, types of things that Misty uh, spoke on earlier. Thank you. Now, I think, Stephen, it, a lot of this is going to be to the industry building trust. And, and that's going to be a huge job for you guys. It just really, you got to build. I mean, everybody has come up. I mean, you guys have represented yourselves well and you say the right things, I know you, I trust you, but the community has to, and that's gonna take work to build that trust. So uh, it, it, I'm assuming you're Matt, and then I, is there uh, Acne, and, and then uh, Michael Levitt, and then one of my favorite people, Kat Packer. Go ahead. My name is Matt Garland. I'm a I'm a, marijuana, a medical marijuana patient of 15 years and a father of two young boys. My biggest concern in cannabis regulation is family safety. I know the best way to keep cannabis away from minors is to regulate the black marketplace into obsolete. I'd like the committee to include affordable and available micro-business licensing under Prop 64 to provide a pathway for the current gray market businesses to operate legitimately and hold them accountable to our communities. We want a vibrant cottage industry in LA. We want small businesses that are guided by a stewardship ethic, not a simple profit motive. I also want to ask the committee to adopt the patient exemption in the MCRSA. The patient exemption is important to provide safe access for patients who cannot afford or otherwise obtain commercial cannabis. Finally, I'd like to ask the committee to include parental protection language in the regulatory framework. Protection language is needed to ensure that Parents' legal cannabis use cannot be the sole or primary basis for any action or proceeding by a child welfare agency or in a family or juvenile court. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I've, I just received the last public comment card we're gonna be able to take tonight, and that's from a, a Hawadi. So that will be the last speaker tonight. So if you could identify yourself. Good evening, everyone. My name is Akhenaten Kakao, born and raised in this neighborhood. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur as well as an educator, and I wanted to voice my support for permissive licensing of dispensaries. It has the benefit of, well, well-regulated licensing has the benefit of being able to create businesses that can't even go and buy from growers if they don't have the proper licensing, and that helps enormously just right there from keeping rogue uh, dispensaries from popping up. But when this licensing is handed out and, and allowed, 
I also want to make sure that uh, my opinion is heard, as, I, as uh, Virgil said, that the communities that have been devastated by the draconian laws that have been enforced for decades about drugs and marijuana benefit more than corporate interests or outside interests so that we avoid this whole situation where essentially what you have are carpetbaggers coming into our communities and profiting when the communities themselves that have been devastated can't do so. And let's keep in mind that these communities are at a deficit as far as money and resources and access for uh, starting new businesses. So they need to be able to be allowed to grow and need to be able to uh, give them the space to do so. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Michael Levin. Could you pull the mic down a little bit, Michael? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Michael Levitt. I am a resident of Pickfair Village. We now have between Fairfax and La Brea approximately 15 marijuana shops, all, uh, which is more than liquor stores that uh, we have plenty of also. The number changes kind of regularly as, as some close and others open, but as someone referred uh, earlier, it's sort of called the Green Mile. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I want to request that the number of dispensaries be limited to 135 and the distance between them be increased at least to 1,000 feet, if not more. And I also want to say if marijuana is such great benefit, such medical benefit, why is it not sold at CVS or Walgreens? This is just another drug Good people evening. use to get high and is no different than claiming that Chivas Regal will cure cancer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Cat, and followed by, is it RSL Clark? Uh, okay, and uh, how would, how would, how would they? How many? Well, I'll let you come up and say it. Good to see you. Good to see you. My name is Cat Packer. I'm the campaign coordinator for California's Responsible Marijuana Reform. I'm hoping that by this time next week, California will realize what uh, a lot of the folks in this room have realized already is that consumers and businesses who are involved in marijuana shouldn't be treated like criminals. There's three things that I'd like to talk to you all about tonight. Uh, the first being diversity. I support the uh, report that the council uh, came out with where it talks about creating a social venture fund. I think that's a great idea. Uh, Virgil, what you were talking about earlier seems like an incubator program for folks that they would be able to participate in. I think that those are the types of things that, uh, that this city council should, should take into consideration. The other thing, public consumption, on-site consumption under Proposition 64, cities and localities can opt into on-site consumption. That's particularly important in the city of Los Angeles uh, because consumption of marijuana is often time to, tied to home ownership. Los Angeles has one of the worst rates of home ownership in the country, so essentially we would just be legalizing this for homeowners to consume. Uh, second, enforcement. We, would, we should collect numbers on who we are enforcing these crimes against, and before we enforce, we should educate. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ariel Clark. Um, I am a cannabis business and corporate lawyer. I've been working with cannabis businesses for the last 10 years. I also am the chair of the Los Angeles Cannabis Task Force, and I really want to thank everyone who is here to participate, really. I mean, I know that we're all coming together from different aspects of, of our city. I have been a longtime resident of the city of Los Angeles, and it's incredibly important how we put this all together, the opportunity for small business operators to become licensed, to become regulated, for this to be legal. It's just an incredible moment in the state of California. There were two specific items I wanted to mention. Number one, under the new medical program as well as a Adult use. There are various license types, as we know, and one really wonderful micro business or cottage aspect of the cannabis industry is the manufacturing. So you have various sorts of topical products, as well as um, folks who are making kind of chocolates and other infused products. So just to kind of bring that out, yes, we've been talking about dispensary and cultivation and other sorts of things, but there are opportunities for these other branded products and for then the city of Los Angeles to, to have jobs and um, revenue from that. So. Just wanted to bring that out. Thank you so much. No, thank you so very <laughs> okay. much. Yes, sir. Thank you for your time. My name is Hamidi. Um, I wanted to push upon the fact that I think inclusion is very important and it's something that's necessary. You have a lot of cottage industry, edibles, companies, people trying to do other things beyond just smoking. And in terms of keeping community members safe and the community safe, I think bringing more people into the fold for licensure is critical because in that way you can 
you can regulate it. You get products that are tested, that are safe, so that you don't have to worry about these pop-ups coming through and people being injured. Um, in terms for the lady that talked about the community, having more access, including delivery services, so that people can have products delivered to their homes will eliminate the trash that they're concerned about or finding the caps and the bottles and having on-site consumptions and things of that nature. So I think what the city should focus on is inclusion because obviously Prop D was a great start, but the, the demand is a lot higher. And so you need to take those things into consideration as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That uh, concludes general public comment. I just want to ask Mr. Harris Dawson, as we wrap things up, if you wanted to uh, say thing, something before I, I bring this hearing to a close. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I, I did want to make sure we thanked everybody that came out and sat with us tonight and were a part of the discussion, the panelists especially, and our city staff members uh, who are giving their own time to have uh, this discussion. I think a couple things uh, that I love to be a part of uh, our future conversations. I think, you know, we heard a lot of back and forth uh, about this question of enforcement between community members and, and distributors, and I think it's, it feels like it's a little bit of a missed uh, point. So uh, folks say, well, there are these illegal businesses that aren't being regulated, and then the answer to that is, well, let's do licensing so we know who's legal and who's illegal. And from the community perspective, it feels like, well, we already know who's illegal and the city doesn't do anything about it. And so the city's got some trust building to do uh, as well with respect to our ability to, to actually enforce what we say is the law. Uh, the second thing is um, some uh, formal discussion on uh, prevention and or, or treatment. Uh, I, I do understand that uh, cannabis does not have addictive properties in it. Uh, I also understand from treatment people that there are people who come in for treatment to addiction to cannabis uh, on a regular basis. So having some discussion about that uh, as we move uh, aggressively into this new uh, time period, I think will be uh, imp very, very important. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I know this is about the business side and the delivery and production and the brick and mortar side of it, but I do still wonder about uh, what's referred to as the black market. So the person who's been selling weed out of their garage for 25 years and doesn't want to open up a shop and you know has been able to do that and has a, a customer base what are what the city's disposition toward that person is going to be uh, going forward given this new environment uh, so those are just a few of the uh, questions and thoughts that came to mind as I listened to everybody uh, share their thoughts and uh, opinions uh, concerns and even hopes and dreams yeah uh, you know I, I, I just want to thank again all of you for coming out I want to thank our panelists and the city uh, staff for always being there. I want to remind each and every one of you that we're going to have another hearing November 29th, 6 p.m. at City Hall in the council chambers, and then on December 7th at 6 p.m. at our Van Nuys City Hall. And, 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 and you know, this is, I would say, an uncomfortable conversation for some people. It is something that many of us, myself included, never thought we'd sit down in a setting like this and really, you know, have this kind of back and forth. Uh, but I want to assure you all that the city of Los Angeles is not going to shrink from its responsibility. We understand that this is not going away. We're not gonna stick our head in the sand. We recognize that government is not about doing what you wanna do all the time, it's about doing what you have to do. And government is about taking people places sometimes where they don't wanna go. And also government is about telling people what they need to know and not what they wanna hear. So that's the types of hearings that I hope that, that we will continue to have like I said earlier, this is the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg. After next Tuesday, depending on what happens, you'll see another series of uh, uh, conversations. And so uh, I appreciate you guys for being engaged uh, in the beginning and hopefully 
uh, we'll be able to come up with something that makes sense and the majority of people can live with. Again, thank you all for coming. This hearing is adjourned.